Hello, welcome to another edition of 1036 here on Milwaukee PBS. I'm Portia Young. In this episode, we'll introduce you to a former educator whose love of chocolate and respect for social justice makes for sweet success in this Wauwatosa shop. Plus, we'll take you to Franklin High School where these students are fast becoming the next generation of filmmakers and video storytellers. We begin with a story about the American dream. It's alive and well in Marathon County where a Hmong couple who escaped the Vietnam War has found peace and prosperity on their ginseng farm. I love my parents, my uh, sister, my brothers and cousin, in-laws. It wasn't for my parents, for I love them so much, I wouldn't be here today. My dad was a soldier from 1972 to 1975. During that time, he said that he really wanted to find freedom for us. So we were trying to escape um, the war. And during that escape, um, somehow my dad got lost in the jungle of Laos. When he came to an area that he thought that was the place that everybody came and stayed together. When he got there, it wasn't what he expected. It was just about a block from where the communists was camping as well, too. The government of Laos found out that my dad was uh, involved with a soldier um, with General Wang Pao. And then any kids from the parents that involved uh, with the uh, war they won't go after, no matter what, with uh, the kids. And so found out that our family is not safe to, uh, to live in Laos. And then I had to find a way to, uh, to, to get to Thailand. All the children were crying and he couldn't, no, none of the parents could keep the kids quiet. So another parent had some opium and the only way out was to drug all the kids. By the time everybody got up and tried to escape, all the kids were gone because the, the parents must have overdosed them. And so 10, 10 of the children died and only me and my sister survived. We've hired the people that would take us across the river to Thailand. So then we are not lucky that time because they sent us to the group, the bad one. And then uh, finally, after they took every money and put everything together, and this two guy came to me. Well, that time they say that you have no life now, okay? Everybody had to die right here. We never thought that we were gonna have a life. So I, okay, that time, we fight for it, and then um, finally, uh, that time, we have, everyone just don't know what to do. Uh, then I finally decided I had to come to the United States. It was too dangerous, so everybody went and hide in the swamp, kind of like an area that had, had some swamp nearby the Mekong. So we all hide in there for, my dad said, about two hours. And um, these big bloodsuckers that was in that swamp came and sucked both of my legs. So by the time we crossed the Mekong River, I was too ill, I was too sick, I was dying. I was about to be gone. And my dad came up with an idea that he had to beg all the men to give us a urine, their urine, to help, so that we had something to drink. So a lot, my dad got a bamboo um, and made that into a cup. 
and ask around all the men to pee into the bamboo. And that pee saved my life. The next morning, I was, um, my mom said I was well enough to be carried on the back and cross the Mekong River. And we made it to Thailand safely. And when we got to Thailand, my dad wanted to find a way to get us to America because this is where we belong. This is where we're gonna grow up and get an education. We're going to make it in America where there's freedom. If I were to think about what I went through back then, I never would believe or realize this day would happen. And realizing where I am now is a, a blessing. They say that ginseng is a powerful living herb that can communicate with Mother Nature. It's completely different than other crop. Uh, the tree and the uh, uh, work and everything else is completely different compared to corn, soybean, and other stuff. Wisconsin has been an agricultural state for hundreds of years. That the soil is so rich and full of nutrients that the ginseng tends to grow naturally with ginseng, it's not an annual crop. It takes four years to harvest ginseng from the time you treat the seed, you, you know, plant the seed, to the time when you harvest in the fall. After harvest, you cannot plant ginseng back again uh, for probably over 20, 30 years. Based on my experience, I never see anyone plant back again to the same uh, field that has been used for ginseng. It needs people, it needs labor force. So you need people to pick the berries, you need people to fix the straws when you're planting it, you need people to pick the roots when you're harvesting it, you need people to wash the roots, you need people to barrel the roots, so it's all labor intense. The Hmong people, um, because they came from the mountains of Laos, they're skills in agriculture are extremely, just tremendously phenomenal. Ginseng uh, was something that they felt that they are able to do, and that they would be good at. Shang Ginseng is a family operation farm, and our family is so important because our kids are learned and trained and been alongside with us and helping us at the age of eight. So by the time they're 10, they pretty much know how to operate all of the equipment from harvesting to planting. We hope that we build the foundation up for our children and that they can continue to grow ginseng and maintain the business. I don't want to waste, you know, all the good time and good life that I have when I suffered through. I came to this country, I wanted to make it something different and want to see a different uh, for, for my life. I believe that uh, I suffer a lot, you know, back then. But then I came here for a good reason and to have a good opportunity in this land, in this country. That means I have to work hard, okay, and then uh, in order to bring my children, um, make a difference for their life, for the future too. So to me, I have to be a role model. And that is very important for me and my family. Uh, I, I hope that uh, the future, uh, we, will, we will not see any problem like I suffered back 
30 years ago. And we'll look forward to the future. That's why we are here at this point, to make it, uh, our life different. I think this is the American dream. I think we, you know, we came here to not only succeed, to, to survive and to struggle and to escape and to live a better life, but to truly come and live the American dream. It's back to school time and some students at Franklin High School are learning something very dear to us here at Milwaukee PBS. They're fast becoming the next generation of filmmakers and video storytellers. Let's see them in action. That's great. They probably come in thinking that they're just going to pick up a camera and start shooting. CJ, Here. Jacob. Here. That's camera one, two, okay. three. And then they start to learn Oh my gosh, there are so many different jobs available. Teacher puzzles by Avery, sibling mascots by Nick, and seven types of high schoolers. There are so many different things to learn. Yeah. It sounds like the mic's picking it up. Yeah, and it'll be better when I'm like right over them. And I think they get a little scared because you've got thousands of dollars worth of equipment in the studio and they're going to learn all those jobs and then work together to produce a show. I realized sophomore year that I should join the program, so I did, and I just fell in love with it as soon as I started. That first day of class, I was like, this is where I belong. If you have an idea, you can take it from the start to the finish with shooting it, writing it, producing it, editing it. It's a lot of fun. So this school has had some form of video in it since the early 80s. So that's 40 years almost of video production of some kind. So. It's got a long history of it. This uh, class is really based off of how a company should run, so we have deadlines we need to meet, and if the deadlines aren't met, then you get you don't get a grade for that project. It's on camera two, but I want you to lean into camera one, and we're going to cut to there. We can keep about 10 kids busy learning different jobs in the studio, so they learn all the studio jobs. I do a lot of work with the cameras and setting up the studio, as well as running the video switcher that we use for our webcast. I really wanted to get the kids a real world experience. Put that in the back of your head. They need to understand the media message. They need to understand how it's created so that they don't become a victim of it, that they really can understand and, and use it. Which one do you think would be a better idea, the skit one or the actual documentation? You have more control over a skit. My directing is like my big dream, but being on camera has never been a huge issue for me. I sometimes host a saber roar. <laughs> Good morning, Franklin High School, and welcome back to the Saber Roar. Our Saber Roar creates community. When you have 1,500 kids, how do you create community? You need a, a common time. Well, the Saber Roar, which is our news and entertainment show, once a week, everybody's watching it at one time. All these great things that go on in a school, a lot of times kid, people don't know about them. We get to highlight all of them and show them back to the students and make them feel good about where they go to school. Seeing the finished product is just one of the best feelings in the world, knowing that all the effort you've put into something over the last month or few weeks has finally worked out and everyone likes it. We do all kinds of videos where teachers are involved, where they are the actors. Following the December 14th vote to repeal net neutrality. It's built around a particular teacher's personality, you know, a video that we do. We built our one-to-one -one program in Franklin. I literally have to e I just email, say, is anybody interested in helping kids out with this video? And I'll get email after email from teachers who are willing to be on camera. And if they're not willing to be on camera, they're willing to donate their room or whatever. You cannot do this without a village. And I, I preach that to the kids all the time because I say to them, you need to treat these people with respect because as soon as they stop wanting to be interviewed or wanting to show up in your video, we don't have a program. I, the reason we have such a rich program is because we have a village that truly supports it in every way possible. What surprised me the most would definitely be the amount of collaboration that's necessary. Uh, you might be able to think that you could get by just doing it yourself, but you can't. You need to work with other people and rely on them and trust that they know what they're doing as well. So where's the um, some video footage of some of these things that we've talked about? When I teach this class, I, I really teach it from two standards, collaboration and communication. And the kids all come in really wanting to learn the video skills. And that is one of my standards as well. But that's, I look at that as the bait to get them to learn the other two things which are going to they're going to use the rest of their life, communication and collaboration. She tries to stress that we need to work with everybody and like 
get out there, like communicate with other people. You need to really work as a team in order to get the project that you want. The kids will tell you it's not a blow off class. The skills that they learn, you know, leadership, problem solving, critical thinking, um, they learn to fail and recover. <laughs> Trying to find time to put aside where I'm not doing my extracurriculars, when I'm not at work, or when I'm not having family problems or needing to sleep. It's <laughs> hard to find time to film, but you just gotta get it in there and you gotta get it done as best as you can with what you have. Yeah, that's all done. I value them screwing up because we all know as adults, when we've learned the best lesson, it's because we've screwed something up really big. From here to here, it seems like a big jump. And then recovered. So I allow them to screw up as long as they're trying, as long as they're moving forward. And in that screw up, they can say to me, this is what I learned, this is what I would do differently. To me, that's pro they've proved learning. What else did he say to you that thought, you thought was interesting? I focus more on the interview about what he did and what he does rather than like, why are you here? I don't want them all to be filmmakers. I want it to be communicators and collaborators. Those are the two things that they will take with them forever. Over the course of the four years I've been in the program, I've really been able to grow my communication skills and I'm much more comfortable working with other people now. That's probably what surprised me the most is how I've grown into learning this new skill and trade and just growing into trying to perfect my work. I think what I'm most proud of is the work that I put in, the effort that I put into each piece and that people get to see it and can relate to it. That's my whole goal is to bring light to these people that don't have a voice and I wanna be that voice for them. Is my collarbone showing? Having the opportunity to have such an outstanding class to be able to show my voice and be that voice is just something outstandingly to be proud of. So those kind of things, knowing that they can make the world a better place, to me, is more important than the video. The video's great, but I really think the, you gotta be a citizen first and a human being first, and if you're a great filmmaker and you're good at it and you got your start here, that's fabulous too. We'll see you next week. Our next story focuses on a local business owner who saw the need and importance of including a large amount of social justice in a special chocolate recipe. He says it's his frame of mind that led to sweet success. Three, two, one. My career essentially was in the education field. I always tried to bring my creativity to the setting that I would work in. And ultimately, I came to the point where it's time to make a change in my life. And it really came down to teaching ourselves. We're a slow food company, and uh, quality and flavor comes first for us. What we're trying to celebrate here at Tabal, some of the, the finest chocolate in the world, single estate chocolates made in an artisan way. American craft chocolate is what we do, and that means we make it from the bean all the way to the chocolate bar. I'm aware of one other, maybe two other bean to bar chocolate makers in Wisconsin. I estimate maybe five other bean to bar chocolate makers in the entire Midwest. Our beans come from Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. And we're really proud to be working with those farmers. The farmers are growing the cacao to sustain their livelihood. And we're trying to do as much as we can to support them. When we go and buy cacao from farmers, I'm trying to do it uh, from a social justice, a social entrepreneurial perspective. And that means helping them increase their standard of living and the people in their community. But it also allows them to have stability in their life by building a relationship with them to help them feel comfortable that I'm going to be buying 
their cacao over the long run. I worked with one of my farmers for three years before I bought some of his beans. Helped him learn how to ferment better and better and better and do a higher quality cacao bean. And eventually we got to the point where he's now one of the best bean producers that we work with. The majority of our chocolate is made with all organic ingredients. And that would be the cacao, cane sugar, pure cocoa butter, and a little bit of pure vanilla bean. Every time we make a batch, it's a unique experience because each cacao bean has a different level of fat, a different level of cocoa, and it has unique characteristics that makes that chocolate bar unique. It's not unusual for us to get comments like, I never really knew what fine chocolate tasted like uh, until we discovered you guys. It's just really exciting to have people excited about our chocolate. Tabal is a Mayan word for relationship, and it really resonates well for us because first and most importantly, we build relationships with the farmers. And I always tell our customers, take your chocolate and go build relationship. Tell us what you think about the story seen here on 1036. We also want to hear your story ideas. Call us at 414-797-3760 and give us your feedback and ideas. And remember, check us out on Facebook. A story from 1036 received a special honor this month. Our story on Milwaukee native Kim Motley won a first place award in the National Association of Black Journalists Awards competition. Kim is a biracial attorney fighting for the rights of women and children in Afghanistan. You can check out our other NABJ awards by going to our website, milwaukeepbs.org. That concludes this edition of 1036. We're ending our show in a very special way, honoring two Milwaukee police officers who lost their lives in the line of duty this summer. Thank you, Officers Irvine and Mahalski, for your service. He was funny, loving, faith-filled, and endlessly optimistic. Now, Chucky served with honor. I know that Chucky was so excited to become a police aide after high school and pursue that dream of being a police officer from little on. I think he had that dream of one day being a policeman. And he was so proud to graduate from the police academy on his birthday, February 16th, two years ago. And on behalf of our members, I offer our deepest sympathies to the family and loved ones of our dear brother, police officer Michael Mahalski. Was Michael rough and tough? You betcha. Michael was also compassionate and had a heart of gold. A man that gave his life to public service. And at the end of God, Michael was a person that viewed himself as the same as a drug dealer, a gang member, a prostitute, as a sinner on this world. Michael was a person that prayed for every person he arrested, fought with, or merely came into contact with. He's what we all want in a cop. On the night that Mike died, like most, I began to reflect on my memories with him. His first work assignment was in District 2, which was my first, and one that I hold to my heart. It is in my belief that the most important thing that my dad gave me was, put simply, himself. And by himself, I mean a father figure that I could look up to as a role model and use him as an example for how I should behave around others and live life. 
and I know how devastated you are with his untimely death. He died way too young and did not deserve what happened. Michael Mahalski is a hero, not just for how he died, but for how he lived. And so for all of us here today, let us honor his life and legacy by striving to treat each other a little bit better, to think about each other a little bit more, and to truly love our neighbor as we love ourselves.